If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. I like going to L.A. Yeah. Do you really? It's like our second home now. Uh, you know, I There's like a lot of cool people. I like the people we, we meet there. I'm not sure if I'm a big fan of L.A. A lot of pretty humans walking around. Mm. Yeah. You know who? You know who two of the prettiest are? Hmm. Who? Doctor Drew and uh, Mike. Wow. From the Swole Patrol. Wow. Good looking people. You know what surprised me? Pretty. That's why so they're on TV. We're supposed to interview Doctor Drew and Mike Catherwood from the Swole Patrol podcast. I walk in. Dr. Drew's sitting down. He's got a t-shirt on. He's fucking yacked. Jacked as fuck. Why Why didn't I not know? Why yeah. doesn't he tell he anybody He's hiding this? them guns. I feel like he needs a better marketing department because that shit, like people need to know, Dr. Drew, you got guns, dude. Yeah, Yeah. no, and he's not young either, he's man. Like, no. Arm wrestle you. He, say, he said he's 60. He doesn't He doesn't look an, a day older than 59, but he said he's 60. Did he say 60? Yeah, he did. Oh, wow, really? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, he looks yeah. great, man. And Mike is a super... Super cool guy, funny guy, and a very cool guy. Actually, yeah, I had a great hilarious. time with them too. Yeah, we had a good interview with those two guys. Doctor Drew left like halfway through the interview. I think he had to go. He had to go be on another radio show. He's on. He a has million like five thousand, which is partially our fault. We should disclose that. Because it is. Yeah, yeah. We showed up a Fl- bit. Flight was late. Late. We had a lot of flight shit this weekend. I know. Right. Yeah. yeah. We had. A, we had that the, one was out of our hands. We had a plane. We had a plane hit a fucking bird on the way. Yeah. To come get us to leave. That's why we were late. Stupid bird. And then Pretty this morning, we were, Justin, Doug, and I were supposed to fly back early. Sal was staying and, and hopping on Max Lugavere's uh, podcast. And we had our flight canceled. The irony of it is we all ended up back together again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's like the universe wouldn't let us separate. I think now's a good time to tell you guys what I did. Mm. I called the airlines. You sabotaged. And, yeah. I'm like, you son of a bitch. I get nervous flying by myself. Gosh. So I want you guys there with me. So thanks for- We're under- like your support animals. Thanks for understanding. Yeah. Anyway, um, Mike and Dr. Drew, this is a great, great combination. Yeah, I like- we, we bounce around on a few topics, man. We, yeah. we, mm-hmm. we got into, uh, we talked about the documentary that we had just watched recently. I was looking forward to talking to Drew because I wanted- Take your to- pills. Yeah, yeah, take your pills. Mm-hmm. I wanted to talk to him about that. We talked about carnivore diet and different types of diets. Uh, then we got into Mike's career, how he started in the, basically in the entertainment yeah. industry and what that's all about. The difference between all the entertainment uh, platforms. Yeah, the guy's, interesting. yeah, he's got a lot of experience in radio, in, in TV, and now podcasting, so... Really cool person to no, talk I, to. I enjoyed that conversation. Yeah, sure. I, I, I'm, I hope this is not the the last time. It's the first time, but I hope it's not the last time that we we meet with them and do a show. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to continue. No, working No, I with felt them. it was like an equal man crush. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah you did. think they liked us too? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I felt like when we were leaving, he, made, he did make a lot of. Mike eye gave me, yeah. Mike gave me kind of this long lingering look. Yeah. Thought, okay. He is yeah. a handsome he, guy. He likes me. He is very attractive. I felt that right away. I agree with that. You almost gave me a ride after. And then he chose not. Whoa! What to. kind oh. of ride? Just like in his car. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. You got to be clear. Yeah. yeah. You got to be. Very Don't get clear. excited. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so we're talking to them too. They're from the Swole Patrol, uh, Doctor Drew and Mike Catherwood. Also, I want to remind everybody something exciting is happening in this month. Uh, Maps Anabolic, the foundational program. This is the program that started it all. It's the one that we typically recommend people. Begin with, it's the best program we have for building muscle and strength for most people and for building the metabolism. It's actually the program I go to when people come to me who need to speed up their metabolism, especially women. It's 50% off. It's under $60. You can find that program at mindpumpmedia.com. You can also find our bundles where we take multiple MAPS programs and put them together and discount them. For example, our super bundle, which is a year of exercise programming. All those bundles plus the 50% off MAPS Anabolic is at mindpumpmedia.com. And without any further ado, here's Mind Pump interviewing the uh, podcasters, Dr. Drew and Mike Catherwood from Swole Patrol. Swole Patrol. Mike, when did you guys start uh, Swole Swole Patrol? What is it, Drew? About six months ago? Yeah, roughly. Yeah, Yeah. about then. Four or six months ago. We had been um, getting, since the Loveline days, because... Drew and I would geek out and pretty much every single moment off the air, <laughs> all we do is talk about diet, nutrition, and and training, that it just naturally started to bleed onto the air and people would call up and start asking health and nutrition questions. Then when people started to realize that Drew was into lifting, then they start asking training questions and then it just kind of built from there. And we got so many people that were always like, you guys got to do a health and fitness podcast. You got to do a training podcast. 
And I, I don't need to tell you gentlemen, it's a saturated market. Right. And to separate yourself from doing it, so Mike uh, does it with a theme song now. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. how he separates himself. <laughs> it's a saturated market, I but I, I figured you know having a real physician, an actual MD mm-hmm. that is into lifting, that could be the hook, and so that's mm. when we just yeah. kind of went with it. It's saturated, but it's saturated with a lot of bad information. Yeah, you know, yeah, pseudo information. <clears throat> it's it's probably one of the worst markets I can think of when it comes to bad well, information. Well, or, or or best as a businessman. Oh right, right. I if mean, you're going to jump in, yeah, yeah. If you're thinking about coming in and disrupting it, yeah, I would say the only thing worse than sort of fitness overall is the subcategory of nutrition. That's oh. worse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh that's, terrible. That's where it gets really yeah. bad. Yeah, you must be extremely it's frustrated with your background looking I, into I, it. I am because it, it's it's sort of, I'm a scientist by training, right? And this is all unscientific or at least bad science at best. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so I, I have a couple people I go to. Like I go to Kate Shanahan because she's a biochemist. You guys know Kate? She's no, fat. I don't. She wrote Deep Nutrition. I okay. think that was her big. Yeah, that's just it though. See, like all, some of the best names, nobody knows who they are. Yeah, yeah. Because, because guess what? It's not sexy. It's not right. headline catching. It's just because science is slow and it's all you can say for sure little mm-hmm. tiny things and she's all about how messed up vegetable fats are and how we got to get back to animal fats that's her big that's her big thing mm. but she's also a big advocate for uh, no grain no no starch carnivore yeah. type stuff so let's talk about that for a second because that's still not accepted in I guess modern western medicine well, but mm, to, it, it's yes yes and no I mean there's w- the weirdest thing at all about nutrition is there's religiosity around it <laughs> like people have religious way more convictions so, way more so than training mm-hmm. like you know yeah. you can get a CrossFit guy to buy into yeah, training for, power, about for try- powerlifting or yeah. uh, Dude, you could get some now and then. body weight yeah. Yeah, calisthenics Much guy to be like hey, well you want to lift weights I'm fine with that but that's my thing yeah Keto guys will fight a vegan. <laughs> yeah, and, it, goes, it goes. It goes. Well, vegans will religion, put in prison. politics, nutrition. Yeah, yeah. And then, then yes. resistance training, and, and, and then uh, sort of mental health type topics. <laughs> right, and then get in there too. But um, I, I've been very weirded out by that fact. It, it, it distresses me when people can't just speak in terms of what we do and don't know. What questions need to be answered. So, uh, in, in, sorry to interrupt, but don't you see, as a, someone who does know, yeah. a lot of guys and gals who, who are who are putting forth this information, they don't know enough to know that they don't know. Correct, mm-hmm. but but that's sort of is everybody in a weird way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, like like for instance, so I went on this carnivore diet at his behest, at his challenge. So what happened to me was I was complaining by my shoulder, my back, and and I used to lift heavy weights when I was a kid. I mean, up to probably age 35 or something. He goes, you got to go back. We talked to Mark Bell. And he goes, you got to lift heavy weights. So we went downstairs. He, he, we went through some motions. I went, all right, I'm going to start doing heavy movements again. I'm going to start lifting heavy weights. And uh, my back got better. <laughs> and if things got better the way they said, I got fat. And I, and I, go, I go, Mike, I know how this goes. I lift heavy weights. I'm just a bigger puffier version of and that's because I, I told him the metabolic changes that are going on it's making you fucking starving right mm-hmm. I, I really i really go crazy my appetite when i lift heavy i, mean, I go nuts oh, and yeah. drew's yeah. a naturally big guy yeah. i mean and so he gets starving and then he starts stuffing himself with <laughs> bs <laughs> and i go well the, 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 the problem is it's is the weights yeah. it's yeah. the weights <laughs> well no I, I go i go he's like i go all right if, all right i'll try this he, he wanted me on the anabolic diet and within three days of cutting out all carbs and grains and things, I was like, oh, shit, this is really something. Mm-hmm. I feel so much better. And it's stuff's falling off me. I'm not hungry. Mm-hmm. And I'm lifting. And I'm getting yeah. stronger. And I'm sleeping better. So I went full into that. I, just, I, didn't, I didn't go to the carb part at all and just, just, just went full in. And I've had an issue. There's more to the story. But it was, it was all positive for about six weeks. I mean, like crazy positive. Like I wouldn't have believed it. If somebody had tried to convince me that somebody was experiencing what I experienced. Now, after six weeks, it, it went bad. It, it, I think I. So I talked to Kate Shanahan last week. She was on my podcast, and I was I was trying to describe to her what happened. She goes, "Oh, you're not in ketosis anymore. You're eating too much." A lot of the ketone for for fuel, particularly your brain fuel, it's got to come from my fat. Mm-hmm. And I was I was eating so goddamn much of of you know yummy things, beef and eggs and things. That I just was starting to put weight back on again. I think that's so the I, number one mistake. I think we we know that people do uh, the ketogenic diet is uh, consuming too much protein. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. exactly what I did. Yeah. I, and it, but I wasn't at first. At first, I was clearly <laughs> doing something right, and I also was I was chipping on peanut butter and other things, and mm. sort of I just was having weird cravings and ch- chipping on peanuts. And, so I had a similar experience, and, and the the thing that I struggled with was trying to get enough fat in. Like I was getting up pushing. I had that too. Yeah, uh, and yeah. I, and when I, I shared this on the show. 
the th- and this is part of why and we we talk a lot of trash about all all diets because everyone is so unique and different and yep. there is no one diet that fits everybody. Well, but let's let's restate that because right. because your opening question was it's not really accepted by the medical mm-hmm. community or anybody. But that fact isn't even sort of factored into the conversation. No, so, right. so we're all this happens to suit my biology exceedingly well. I can tell it's some suited for mm-hmm. the hills of the Ukraine where my family are from. <laughs> something they ate deer raw probably or something. Who knows? But but clearly it's suitable to me. I don't know that it's suitable to somebody from the Yucatan. Well, I, I don't know. Well, well then you also get like what ended up happening to me was here I here I was and at that time I was weighing about two twenty five, two thirty or so, and I'm a six foot three guy. I'm a big guy, beefy, and and I was eating too much protein, so I was like, okay, I got to since I'm trying to stay ketogenic, I'm going to try and increase my fats. Well, I was up to eating like four hundred grams of fat. How are you getting it? So that was the it's, problem. It's hard. You got, yeah. I, my only source butter, is bacon, butter and bacon. Butter and bacon. That's all it's macadamia nuts. Yes. Well, macadamia nuts. Drinking, drinking, drinking and coconut avocado. Oil. Those are the three. Yeah. But avocado kind of, and, but but the three. So macadamia nuts, something's not right about them. I can tell. I can right. just tell it's not giving me available fat. Bacon, fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's how much fun. of that can you do yeah. safely? What about heavy cream? But, just guzzle heavy it. Heavy cream's got a bunch of but sugar even, in but it. Even no, that. it doesn't. Yes, it does. No, it eating, doesn't. If you're drinking that much of it, you it Regular does. heavy cream. But not even like even, some even so, though, exotic at, at one point, I, I started yeah. to ask myself, like, when when a good 30 to 40% of my diet was comprised of those four foods, this yeah. can't... because How be- good could it be? Yeah, right. Yeah. I believe well, in so, food so, rotation. So, and so I right it's- then, I got my cholesterol check. I thought, I got to see what's going on. I've still got bruises from my staff through my blood. And uh, my cholesterol had never been better. Yeah. I mean, I'm telling you, yeah. it was ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's interesting. My, my, I've been trying to get my HDL up for 20 years. It went up like 25%. Well, here's, the, here's another And my factor. LDL was pegged. And they were both the same, actually. And my triglycerides went down on all that bacon. Mm. That's, I never would have believed that. Here's yeah. the factor you also got to mention is that I'll tell Drew something. Way down, by the way. 75. Four years ago. That's crazy. Give it like a five-year buffer in that I'll give Drew advice <laughs> and say he should do something. <laughs> and then five years will go by and then he'll hear it from someone else. That's, that part, of it, that's part of being to. a scientist, yeah. bro. Right. That's what happened. Until, until there's something well, conclusive. Does, by the way, yeah. I wouldn't I even I be... I wouldn't believe it. I wouldn't even yeah. be that offended if you waited for an actual scientist because I certainly have no well, credentials. Mike, it's... He, he, uh, like for instance, I've been telling him, dude, you got to start deadlifting. You got to start really looking heavy. <laughs> yeah. You know, to take care of all your posture problems and your yeah. achy back. No, no, no. Mark Bell, he's not a fucking scientist, <laughs> and he came down for one day. He met Drew for an hour, and next thing I know, Drew's like, oh yeah, well, I got yeah. myself some chalk. Yep. I'm ready but, to fucking but, but, go. Hold on. <laughs> you, you, the diet thing was all you this time. Okay, I, you converted me. Like I did it for you specifically, even though I've been hearing about it forever. In fairness, though, it wasn't until Doctor Baker came through, and it, then it's really, all I, 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 I ruminate on this stuff it stays yeah. with me trust me mm. I, there was I ruminate no I do it I, I think I think I think I cogitate on it and and then you know then I develop a sort of a, a sense of it that's how again science is all about skepticism right it's yeah all about no 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 mm-hmm, no right. until the until the evidence right. is stuff that you got to go all right maybe I, that's what I think you, part which, of the well I was gonna say I think part of the problem with with nutrition is uh, a, a couple of things we already know, there's some general truths that we find that mm. seem to be true <laughs> But there's such a dramatic individual variance, and I think it has a lot to do with a lot of different things, including the, the body's immune system. Because now we're starting to learn that. I swear you to God, develop- my, how many times was I sick when we were on the radio together? Oh, all the time. I would not have been sick once yeah. since this diet. Are, and I, I can tell it's a difference. And you're familiar with le- like leaky gut syndrome and what they talk about, that yeah, kind of if stuff? Yeah, if, if that exists. And we don't, really, we don't know what to do with any of that mm-hmm. stuff yet. We, we don't know what to do with the yeah. bacterial flora. We know it's important. We know it's something. We don't know what. But yeah. sometimes anecdotal evidence can be of value. Yes. I mean, it, especially yes. with the individuality aspect of it. And I go back to the my bodybuilding days and I remember getting ready for a, a bodybuilding competition and I was training with this one guy who was almost exactly my measurements. He, he was he was naturally a little leaner than me, but he was about 5'10", about 180 naturally. Um, and he and I were prepping for the same one. He was eating three, 400 grams of carbs going into the show, weeks into the show and shredded to the bone. If I went over 40, I was bloated. I would <clears> be fat. I, it just, it, it, the variability is not, it's not a little bit. The variety, Huge. you know, the variety to what works mm-hmm. for each human metabolism is dramatic, you know, between, and that's why. Not that's, to mention, I believe that is always changing too. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine so, what it would be like for me now at age 39. That was 23 I, years I old. I feel yeah. on this crazy diet kind of the way I did in my 20s in terms of my relationship with weightlifting and diet and stuff. But then I was. How, eating, about, the, how about the boner? 
Is it uh, in better? The, maybe a little. Oh, why, why is it the boner? But, but, like, is it? <laughs> but, but it was distinctive all, boner. You know, but well, Drew's all, dick is like God. You have to refer to it as a title. It's okay. The <laughs> dick. It's the, the boner. In the, Super in shiny. The, the third person, like a yeah. professional athlete. <laughs> so, 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 what did you do to get the fats? That's what I want to know. So it ended up being that I was chasing the butter. So what did you do? So what I ended up doing, I stayed with that for maybe three months and then eventually got to the point where I said, this just can't be ideal for my body yes. for me to be consuming this much. Plus, you started getting palate fatigue from some of that. Yes, you eat the yes, same food yes, over and over again. Yes, yes. Yeah. I'm right there. What right. Do you do? What'd you do? So well, I've, I, now I'm back. Now, so let me explain to you what I did before that. So I was competing right before that and I was eating 600 grams of carbs. So I went from being a 600 gram carb guy, and what what prompted all of this was on our show one day, and what something that we all talk about is we're very open to trying different things and exploring that. And I remember these guys, Sal had actually already done the ketogenic diet, and he'd be like, you know, I just want you to try and see how you feel. And I'm like, why? I eat 600 grams of carbs, I eat whatever the fuck I want, and I'm and four, you look good, yeah, yeah I'm four yeah. percent. Why would I even think about doing yeah, that? Yeah. And he goes, and I caught myself saying that on the show, and I thought, well, that's okay, shame on me. Why, why not then? Why not put myself through that and see what I notice, right? So I did, and a couple things that I really liked. I liked how satiated I felt. Yes, I did. Me too. I got rid of cravings. Like Completely. I, I, I used to be someone who yep. craved yep, ice cream and shit. Like that's those. Me. Those things were 100%. Right. It completely eliminated yep. that. Yep. And to stay true and stay lean and stay to a diet became really, really easy. Yep. The only knock that I had was I found myself always eating these kind of same yep. foods. Yep. So now I, now I live in kind of a more balanced, like I would say, and I, I haven't measured and weighed since I competed, but I'm probably more about 200 grams to 250 grams of carbohydrates now. And my fats are probably right around the same, so I can now keep kind of this even bit. Like that metabolic where, where you get flexibility. The fats? So my my fats, I'm not as picky as I was before, yeah. right? So they so I, just animal. Yeah, so mostly mostly animal fats. I'm just not as like right. because I'm, I kind of I feel like I'm headed that direction. Because said, I'm, yeah. I'm, let me tell you what I noticed. The big thing was that we kind of ate this way for almost a year. And when I started to reintroduce the carbohydrates, I actually saw this huge like spike in, I felt my hormone levels, like my libido kicked up. Mm. I felt my strength in the gym kick, kick up and the energy kick up. So as long as I- if, as but, long, but I had the same experience going to ketosis though. So, so yeah, did I. Yeah. But then it started to kind of plateau That's after- That's right, exactly. It just, they it, weren't- It's weird. It, so your brain theoretically likes ketones better than glucose. It's more efficiently brought into the mitochondria. So that's kind of what the high comes from. Your brain's going, this is better. This is I better. felt this too, yeah, the mental and, and clarity right clarity away. Clarity and, and le- didn't need so much sleep and a little bit high, I think, at yes. some level. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then that kind of Yeah, then it just away. kind of leveled out. And, yeah. and, and I think I, that's because most of those ketones comes from our fat. And once you lose, you stop metabolizing so much of your own fat, that, that thing isn't happening. Well, I also so think that our bodies are just adaptation machines. Man. Yeah. And so right. I think whatever that's we right. throw at it at first, that's like right. it's that first initial like, boom, you feel all that. And then after a while, it just kind of leveled out. And yeah. it wasn't that I was feeling bad. It was just like, then I went through this, okay, well, let's try and introduce some more carbohydrates. Let's not try and just follow a diet. Let's try and feed my body some yep. more carbs and see how it responds. And so far, you know, since I've re- reintroduced the carbohydrates up to about two two fifty, I feel amazing right now. Well, long term well, ketogenic diets are correlated with low testosterone after yeah. a long period of time. Yeah. And from an evolutionary standpoint, it makes sense that sometimes we should probably eat some carbs, and sometimes we should go that's without right. them. Yeah. Right. You know, especially seasonally when you look at the seasons. That's right. And that's the same thing. When I went keto, I I had tremendous benefits. Then I stayed on keto for a very long time. My reasons were a little different than Adams. I have uh, gut issues. And avoiding carbohydrates seemed to seem to remedy a lot of that. But then after being on it for like a year and a half, uh, is I stopped getting the benefits. Started introducing more carbohydrates, and now I'm getting like I did well, the first time I went keto. Yeah. So I think the body just just so changes. Go back and forth a bit. It's yeah. Right that's what I think. I yeah. think I think that's what's ideal. I think that's right. And that's exactly how I used to teach clients. Was they they give me oh what diet do I follow? Well you know which one would you like to try? Anything any use on those keto those uh, powdered ketones? The kind of oh, ketones. the beta hydroxybutyrate yeah, any powders. Of that stuff, yeah. You know what's interesting about they will raise your ketone levels. Yeah, because I, I know it kickstarted me a little bit and back into mm-hmm. ketosis. I think I think or at least helped me regain that feeling, and so I was more motivated. To, to, I so certainly we, like yeah, them. I, I mean, like. I wouldn't have gone that route, but I got a bunch of free stuff, and I certainly liked them from the sense that I got. I definitely felt like a, yeah. a mental clarity. Yeah, you got a yeah. something. Well, we it. got we had Doctor Dom Diagostillo on the show, and yeah. he's yeah. like the one of the experts on the on the subject. And one of the things he said to me was, "We don't know how in the context of not being in natural ketosis and then adding, uh, yeah. you know, a supplement with you know with ketones, 
what that's necessarily going to do right. because that's right. Never in you know never in nature are you going to have elevated le- levels of ketones and also have you know lots of glycogen in your body. Right. Yep. But right. that's what a lot of people are doing, and so we don't know exactly what that you know what that's going to do. Now I heard you guys sense. mention Sean's name. Now what do you think of that extreme? Because now you got the guy who eats. Uh, were you talking about Sean Baker? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. just a carnivore. And you saw his blood work, right? Did you guys see his blood work? Did he talk about it? He discussed it. Yeah, Yeah, lipids were off, and his testosterone was just in the was in the in the in the basement. But he says he feels really good, and uh, he's theorizing that his his testosterone. Oh, it was really low. It was below normal. I forgot what the number was for a fifty-eight year old man. It was like a hundred something. It was yeah. It was pretty low. Was it that low? Yeah, it was really low. I couldn't remember how low it was because two hundred something would be sort of it's old man. But but you know. Oh no, Drew's is ten thousand. He looks like it's ten thousand. Are you? guys familiar with the studies that they have they've done with the continual glucose monitors fascinating stuff they'll find that some people will get a a, a spike in yeah. insulin yeah. from like an avocado or yeah, something yeah, yeah. more mm-hmm. than so that suggests that there's an immune response possibly going on right because how can you get a spike in something with that's just fat yeah. right unless, unless genetically you were made that yeah, way, right. Right. that's yeah. how your body responds yeah. I, I, I bet i'm one of those people i've, I've naturally st- been avoiding avocado because it doesn't feel the same as the other stuff for mm. some reason. So it's okay, but I don't know. I feel yeah. Like so what, but what do you guys think? What do you guys think about what yeah. Sean's doing? Because I think that's crazy to live off of straight ribeye steaks year round like that. I think it's crazy, but then I analyze it from you know you getting back to your point about how adaptive the human body is. Right. You know, I know I I talked to Steve Maxwell about it, and he's a guy who's had the luxury of traveling the world mm-hmm. and, and traveling the world with the intention of fitness and nutrition. And he and he said one thing you notice is that people can be healthy eating fucking bread. You know, yeah. it's amazing how well, that's the why, human body that's adapts. That's why we develop to, stuff like that. Is, you, know, you know, to deal with starvation. And there's mm-hmm. there's you know African tribes that eat nothing but yeah. roots, right. literally nothing but yeah. roots, no yeah. meat, and they're shredded. And then there's people in, in parts of Eastern Europe that are mm-hmm. eating uh, almost like Dr. Baker, and and they are fine. And it so can't I, be optimal though. I, right? I don't know that, that that's it might be for him, well, you know. Yeah. He may have such an ir- a reactive immune system cuz right. he said he eats any vegetables and he bloats and feels terrible. Yeah. And I wonder if it's not the diet isn't necessarily what's doing it but it's the avoidance of all these foods that he has a reaction to. So he's just eating something that he has low reaction to a lot of which also seems that you know also I'm has just closer I'm fats closer to him somehow. Do we know what his ethnic heritage is or anything? He's very white. I know. I mean, I'm not going to a lot of white. <laughs> You're super white. I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I forgot that if white people <laughs> right. come from different places. Uh, but uh, I would guess Dr. Baker is, is more Arctic like circle. Eastern European. That's than, what I like, thought. Yeah. And so I, that, that's my thing. And I, I, there's something in that, that. I don't know. I don't know if it's immune. I don't know what it is. Yeah. I don't know what it is. Yeah, I don't know. It's. I, I think it has to, to try do- it, actually. That's one of those. Because yeah. I've actually heard, too, it it has some benefit to sleep apnea, and that's something that in my, my sleep family- is so much better. Well, I was going to ask you about your sleep. Way yeah, better. Way better. And and vegetables, It's. I seem to slide back when I eat. I, I eat mm. them because I just think it's important. Mm-hmm. But I start to slide. I start to tell you I'm not- You get an inflammatory uh, response? No, I'm not. it's not like I'm uncomfortable. It's just like I'm not as- Elevated as I am when I'm just doing it by itself. You got to ultimately listen to your body. You know, yeah. we've been in fitness now for I've been doing it for over 20 years, and so when we get into discussions like this, it's always like I can think of all the I've trained thousands of clients, and I've had clients that thrived off of a vegan diet, a yeah. completely vegan, like literally yeah. thrived. I could see the benefits. I could see their health. And, and, the, and there's on the religious side. There's another issue too. Is it what are you doing to the planet with all this meat? Yeah. And, and that's the other religious piece that gets factored in all. Yeah. People. Go. That's the that's the that's where I see the most uh, religious fervor is in the vegan community, and it's not the same as it is with other diets in the sense that, you know, I eat paleo, so I identify with yeah, that. Right. It's because they, they look at it also from a moral standpoint. Yeah, and a lot, of them will, will, a lot of them will disregard their health just because they don't want to eat Well, and, and there's something there's something incredibly admirable about that. I mean, I, if you look at the vegan diet it, it, purely from a moral perspective, I yeah, know, I can that's something it. that I get behind. Mm-hmm. It's I, I get upset when that moral uh, take bleeds over to you trying to tell me that it's actually mm-hmm. beneficial for my health. And I go, well, you don't know that. You right. really here's, don't. Here's one know? of them. Let me put a wrinkle in the moral argument, <laughs> which, which is that if cows didn't have the present symbiotic, or let's let's say they overnight lose the symbiotic relationship they have with the human, uh, go extinct immediately. <laughs> yeah. Immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you ever species, want to, per- the species will 
be gone. You ever yeah. want to prevent an animal from going extinct? Let humans buy them and yeah. own them. Well, well there's also the other. own them or, or benefit from them in some fashion. Absolutely. Yeah. There's or, also the or other or hitch food. too that didn't we find out recently that the plants are just like bre- yes. breathing yes. from yes. the fertilizer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. 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 Uh, agriculture kills so many animals <laughs> to begin with too. So all the gophers and shit that need to be killed. Fact. An aspect of it though. Insects are we going to hold? I know, right? Yeah. This is hierarchy. That's. I actually think that's going to be one of the biggest things that we're going to see boom in fitness. Cricket protein. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, protein. Yeah, There's yeah, a lot of insect insects. Yeah. Got that. Well, why not? Yeah. Right. It's yeah. available. It's it's people. Well, it doesn't taste yeah. have the moral fantastic. Yeah. 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 Who cares? It doesn't yeah. taste that bad. Well, actually, I'm, they're going to refine it down. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah no, we've I mean, had it. We've yeah. had it. It's not that yeah. bad. We've had protein bars that are made with it, and it's, yeah. it's actually not that. And bad. The whey protein from the or the, the dairy proteins from the '80s are vastly different than what we have now. So, oh, so different. Hopefully, yeah. the cricket protein in 10 <laughs> years will be like yeah. muscle milk. Yeah, I don't even know what the fuck that was that we were eating all those shit because I think all the studies that came out now that they're finally testing all that shit, going like, yeah, 80 percent that was on the market wasn't even yeah. what it said was it was in just there. Talk about yeah, we're eating baking soda. <laughs> it was yeah, for yeah. the last 20 who, years. Who do you complain to when you eat cricket protein you find a, a bug in your protein? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> uh, added bonus. It's yeah. yeah. supposed to be there. What do you, what about, what do you guys think about, I think the, some of the, the most exciting science coming out now is, has to do with fasting. I remember when I first yep. started in fitness. I know, I don't, I don't know what to do with that with this fat diet. Yeah, oh, uh, yeah. I'll tell you what. I, I well, now see. Because when I was eating a regular diet, fasting were great. Well, it won't work as well. Yeah. And I think Walter Longo talks about this. And who else is, was talking about that? It's like it, you're already, when you're running like a, a high fat or even like a Keto low jack fat. diet. Yeah, it's you're simulating. It's very kind of simulating. It's a kind of a part of your metabolism is fasting. Right. It is. Well, it is. Even right. Dr. Baker talked about it with us. Yeah. He, you know, I think uh, fasting can be tremendous if you're eating a lot of glucose or any yeah. glucose containing stuff. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, you know, if, if you're in a. a if you're in a high fat diet or even in a carb deprived situation, not, not necessarily big. nutritional ketosis, but just in a carb deprived situation, yeah. um, it doesn't seem to be as beneficial. But well, I mean, I know I I prefer it just because, I, you know, back in the time when I was eating eight times a day, six times a day, whatever, I I was constantly hungry, yeah. even though I was eating more frequently. Yeah, and I was. I was tired. I mm-hmm. mean, there's something about con- consistently giving myself that feeding. Well, I love I love the, the fat, regardless of what diet you're on. What we talk a lot about with fasting is just breaking that these poor relationships with food, right. especially when it's we, the small meals every day. That's, right? That's because that's we, I come from that too. Yeah. I was eating eight meals a day myself, and it was all about the timing, and I was constantly right. consuming it. And then when you kind of break free of those chains, because I I mean I I was the insecure skinny kid who could never get bigger. Right. So I always like you know I wake up in the morning and my scale would be down three pounds. Oh shit! Three pounds of muscle fell right. off of me, and then I'd be scarfing food all the time. And, and that's just the opposite extreme of the people that you know starve their bodies and over binge and do that. So I I like what the fasting does for with just breaking free of that. Oh wow, look, you don't oh. eat for 24, 48 hours, you're actually fine. Oh, there's <laughs> a, there's a reason why fasting is present in every major religion in the world and every major culture. It's it's been present for thousands of years, and I think that's part probably part of the reason from breaking those chains. I mean, let's let's be honest. If you are born and raised in a modern Western society, you've probably never felt true hunger. Yeah, if you really yeah. think and, about and that. And hunger is our natural state. Yes, right. yes. Yeah. We've never felt it. What we yeah. what we attribute to hunger is, is cravings yeah. right. or context. Like I'm at a birthday party or I'm at the movies. Yeah. I want popcorn or I'm stressed out. So when you fast, because I do I do a 48 hour to 72 hour fast once a month, which by the way is one of the best things I've ever done for my health and for my relationship to food. When you're not eating for three days and you're stressed out or anxious or bored and you can't reach for food, you got to figure out, okay, well, how do I deal with this without my drug, which happened to be food? Yeah. And then, of course, like Adam, it's realizing like, oh, if I don't eat for a couple of days, I'm not going to lose all this muscle. I'm not going to freak. It's not going to kill my body. And then there's a strange effect that happens when I start to refeed. I almost get this... How did you feel after a show when you'd start feeding yourself a lot of food? Fantastic. And your muscle, you just blow up. And look, oh, I get that same effect mm-hmm. post-fast. Yeah, but that's a, that's a, you start this glycogen deposition of the muscle. I, mean, I, I fluid goes with that. I know that, but yeah. I also get this like muscle boost effect. It's because I'm very you familiar. Strength. You get strength. I get strength, but I also, know, I also see this kind of almost stepladder effect. Well, they just came out with that doing. study recently with the seven weeks on, seven weeks off, what's happening. Oh, that's a, fa- that was that's a fascinating That's fascinating study. as shit. Yeah, they took, they took uh, two groups of men and they had one group train hard for seven weeks, take seven weeks off, and then work out again. They were testing uh, the theory of muscle memory. You guys have heard of muscle memory before, right? You lose muscle, gain it back twice as fast the second time around. They not only gained back what they'd lost over that seven weeks, but they had also gained an additional 5%. Wow. And so they're theorizing if, you know, if there's more to muscle memory than, than we realize. 
There's, it's, it, like I said, when I fast, and this is anecdote, about three or four days post fast, I get this incredible, uh, you know, muscle building effect and strength effect more so than if I didn't fast and if I just went straight through in the first place. Do you this train may, this during? This may be fast. my next obsession. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, if I do train during a fast, it's very light mobility work, full range. I'm not trying to push my body. I'm not trying to go super heavy. Um, but about two, three days post fast, I feed myself very slowly. I get this like I, I. You can ask these guys. I'm a good mm-hmm. 10, 10, 12 pounds yeah, heavier than gaining. I was before. Yeah, and it's it's a hundred percent from. What, the, do you, what do you guys think of some of these genetic tests are available for these various questions about what kind of muscle loading you should be doing? Like twenty three and me, or like what no? We, there's a uh, fit, fit DNA, fit DNA, a fit one. genes. Oh, there's a bunch of them. I don't know if we know enough. They're very specific, and yeah. there's a whole family of genes they're looking at. And I did I did the profile, and man, they nailed me. Did they? Yeah, really? it was an exact. What did they say with yours? Uh, they were they were talking about my relationship with glucose and how mm. it would work, and, and they also were saying that you know I was I was trying to figure out heavy weight how I, I, yeah. I essentially said every time I've had a trainer they're always trying to take me towards high high, high repetition volume. high volume mm. and it's just I don't get anything out of it and without me saying that he goes you won't get anything out of that you're, oh wow you're, you're gonna have to you lift heavy you have to lift every day he said he goes if you take more than high two frequent- days up. More two days off, you're going to lose though everything. Wow. And he's abs- it's absolutely See, me. that's my body type. And it's I always talk about me. that on the shows. The, yeah. the level of frequency that I have to train, it's just a trip. Yeah, me too. This, I, I don't have to kill it every day, but I just no. got to keep yeah, it no, going. Yeah, no, just touching just it. it, going. That's yeah. it. Now, the more uh, the more experience you have, that's true generally as well. The more experience you have, the, the shorter that muscle protein synthesis signal lasts. And they find that. I just read another study. Meaning you don't have to work out as hard or as long? You have to work out frequently. So yeah, like frequently. a beginner can work out, hit a body part once a week, yeah, and yeah. notice gains. If you're experienced, that muscle oh, building no, yeah, signal very falls different. very quickly. Very so different. hitting it, you know, frequently. It's funny you talk about lifting heavy, and we've been talking about like diets in relationship to, you know, how we evolve. It, but before you just pick that guy, I want to make sure you don't forget to talk about your, the work you're doing now with that video stuff. Yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy. So, 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 Dave, go ahead. Follow okay. Your train of thought. So train what I was going to say is, um, you know, heavy resistance training. I think in the context of modern life, like you had mentioned, lifting heavy, your appetite went through the roof. That's oh, yeah. your metabolism. Oh yeah. That is not a good thing when no, you're a hunter gatherer. I know, yeah. but in modern in, yeah. in modern society, that's a great thing. Yeah. And you know, we've been speculating this for a while because right now, when you go to the doctor or they recommend activity, what do they recommend? Thirty minutes of vigorous Walking, cardiovascular running. activity. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody says lift weights. Oh no, no, I do. Well, but, but I mean, well, you're but ahead I, of the curve. Yeah, yeah. But I have forever because that, that particularly older patients, they would constantly oh, say on that now. Yeah. It's like resistance training, resistance yes, training. So, yes. They got to do it and they I, don't. I think resistance training, if you look at just if you have to pick a form of exercise to yeah. combat all the problems with modern life, yeah. right? Obesity, insulin yeah. sensitivity, immobility, yeah. loss of bone. Metabolic syndrome. Yeah. All, resistance training, hands down, is yep. a killer because yep. you, 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 you get your metabolism to speed up, your, body, your muscle, obviously. The more muscle you have, the more sensitive you are to insulin. Mobility, look what happens to old people when they fall down and yep. break a hip or whatever. Yep. Yep. They yep. die from it. Yep. Resistance training is the answer. We've been talking about this for a while. Totally I wonder agree. how long it's going to take before all doctors, not just you know, forward-thinking it, ones it's, like you. It's hard to get people to do it in generations that have no relationship with that kind of movement. Right. I think don't. it'll change it's a the skill. next 20 like years. Older, older females. Yeah. And I, by older, I don't mean old. I mean my wife, you know, who's, who's 40, she... She has this aversion to the idea of lifting weights oh, yeah, because yeah. she thinks she's going to turn into mm. uh, an IFBB pro in a week. Right, yeah, right and I, if it was and only I that easy, I, right. know, right? <laughs> I, I try to explain that to her. I was like, "You understand that every high school football player would would do that if you know they don't. There's not a there's a reason why so many young men." put in out years and years of work to <laughs> try hours, to gain hours. ten pounds of muscle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, 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 you you suddenly think that you're this genetic anomaly that's going to pick up a weight and all mm-hmm. of a sudden become this freak and and but you know so many I, I, CrossFit's been the only thing that really has gotten women by and large. To CrossFit throw. was a revolution in yeah. in our and just in the business of fitness because you know managing gyms for as long as you know I have squat rack we'd have a, I'd have a thirty five thousand square foot gym I'm talking about like you know mainstream gyms right mm-hmm. there'd be one squat rack or two squat racks and they'd have dust on them yeah. Yeah. now squatting. everybody's squatting and deadlifting and even even women are starting to do it but it, but it, in, in terms of resistance training I'll tell you you know training clients I would get women who would come see me who were consuming thirteen hundred calories a day doing eight hours of cardio for the whole week so over an hour a day anything over thirteen hundred calories they'd gain weight I'd switch them to heavy resistance training, start to reverse diet them, and I'd get them up to 2,000 calories a day with leaner body fat. Yeah. Just that, that effect on metabolism is just, it's incredible. It's, it, there is still, I mean, there's this weird thing. I mean, it's just like, 
uh, racism or, or homophobia or so generationally it's going to phase out and mm-hmm. I mean, by, because now there's kids women as well that are growing up with the idea that resistance training is as healthy if not more so than well, i think than cardio and it's, th- it's going to it'll it'll phase out and who knows I me mean, 40 years it's going to be so mainstream it's going to become mandatory what i'm really curious about and what we're going to see i think in the next 10 years that we haven't really seen um the cause from this is the or the effect from the the iphones and the posture yeah I mean, I oh, personally, man. I personally saw what it did to me. So I had this little, just I tore my Achilles about eight months ago, and that was one of the worst injuries I ever dealt with. Kind That's of, serious. Yeah, it was. Mm-hmm. And it fell off my training, and during that time, work didn't stop for me. So I'm constantly still doing what I always do. But because I wasn't countering that with my resistance training, I mean, I literally, and we have like a, we do this, we have a zone test that we do for all people, and you know, I was going back, and it's just for my upper cross, and to kind of see where my forward head and my shoulder, my shoulder girdle is at, and I could see like. I moved in inches within just a matter of eight months of not training consistently. And I went, holy shit. Like I'm aware of this. I'm a trainer. I know how to come combat this. And I noticed that big of a difference. Like what about these 10 year olds and 13 year olds that they're glued to these things four right. hours Daily plus. Daily patterns. A, like yeah, I think we're going to see something in, in, in posture and body mechanic. Neck. Neck. Yes, that we just bad. so bad. You, you, you know, I know, I know you're, uh, you're an expert in, in addiction. How, what do you think about the, the electronics uh, addictions that we're starting to see? Or, or can you classify it as an addiction? You can, but it, I mean, I always caution against overusing the addictive you know, sort of model. But uh, in certain things, for sure. I mean, whether it's porn being the big one. I mean, obviously for that. I and mean, we call it process addiction generally when people are involved with too much with electronic media. Mm. Uh, the video game stuff, clearly it's an issue. Whether it needs primary treatment is controversial. Uh, most of the people with the video game preoccupations have an underlying psychiatric problem. That's one of the big compulsive behaviors. When you treat the psychiatric problem, it kind of goes. Oh, away. interesting. It gets a lot hmm. better, but sometimes some people need primary treatment. Interesting. Just couldn't so. the same be said for actual drugs and alcohol too? I mean, isn't there? Uh, how many times are, is a, a drug addict dual diagnosis? All the time, but but with, with drug addiction though, you have a truly a separate <coughs> and second need, problem. Yeah. That it's like a separate, physiological needs well, a separate treatment. I also feel like too with a drug addiction, like it's um, it's more obvious of how bad or dangerous it is. Where like with the phones, like a lot, it's we're promoting how amazing it, it's still. Even though it's extra physiological in terms of how we respond to it, it's still normal physiology. Drugs are abnormal physiology. No, I've and always said. People always ask me. They 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 say. Uh, you know, you're so you're so courageous and, and brave that you were able to handle addiction at such a young age. And I was like, no, it actually made it a lot easier. It was very clear that I was a complete pile of shit because I was 21 years old. I had no job. I was living on people's couches. I had no money. If I was if I was 50 and had money in the bank. I could very easily have rode that into the sunset for a good decade before mm. I was confronted with the notion that my life had gone awry. It was how, very, how long did it take you? Like before you realize that it took me three honest. Well, I would say honest tries. It took me three <laughs> tries in rehab. The final one being uh, the truly honest, non vain effort at, at trying to get clean. But I when I when I was nineteen, I went, average is four treatments in five years for the average person. For me, really, it was average. three and three and three, yeah. three three treatments in three years. Is that but, for all drugs or? Well, it's, it, that studies have been done on severe alcoholics. And, okay, and it's four treatment. Was it four treatments in five years? I think it is. Uh, in order to get one year of sobriety, and what do you, what I was I couldn't wait to talk to you about. I just watched the documentary. Uh, I think it's called Magic Pills. Is that what? Oh, it was? oh no no no! Take your pills. Take, Take your pills. pills. Mm-hmm. What do you think uh, about Adderall. the Adderall? Adderall, oh, Ritalin, fuck, and fucking disaster. It's fucking yeah. one out of every ten children. They, well, this is the statistic Don't that even, they said. I can't even. Yeah, I know. So I I never experienced it, and, and I'm not even worried about the children. I'm worried about what's happening to the adults. Well, I just took my first one like maybe a year ago. Yeah. Never experienced before. I, I I keep hearing it, keep hearing, it, keep hearing Adderall? it. Adderall, yes, mm-hmm. first time taking. We were getting ready to do something, and I took that thing, and I was like, "Holy shit!" Yeah. And then someone tells me like, "Oh, that's only ten mil. Was it ten milligrams? I think so. Ten milligrams. We so took they're they're said, kids. Right? Some kids are up to twenty yeah. or thirty oh, milligrams. Yeah. The generic name for the molecule is d- dextroamphetamine. It's meth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's meth. meth. It's yeah. a methamphetamine. Do you need to know anything else? <laughs> <One> <laughs> that's what blows my mind, though, is that we're prescribing we're, we're doing, 13-year-olds my, meth. My, my profession makes the same mistakes over and over again since about the 1860s. Mm. It, I, I, and I have a lecture where I just talk, chronicle all the repetitive mistakes that, that we make, particularly on the brain stuff. 
Mm-hmm. It's unbelievable. Well, I didn't realize how long it had been around. It's just they keep rebranding it, right? So they they, they, they keep bringing it out. Yeah, we we are because of the the science is shitty because it's all short term. Mm. Yeah, everything when you look at brain stuff very yeah. short term, you can find all kinds of great outcomes. People, lo- wouldn't you love to take that for a couple months? Oh, you feel a lot better, right? Yeah. Whoa, I love that. Probably disaster. lose a little weight. Disaster long term, yeah. and, and so you know the the studies are never long enough with with these cut molecules, mm. just particularly on the sort of stimulant and addiction side. Do you think that? Do you think the growth of of the diagnosis of ADD and ADHD isn't so much that more kids have it, but that we're just yes and no. Uh, the, the one of the dirty the, again one of the little secrets about ADD is uh, one of the manifestations of childhood trauma, adverse childhood experiences. ADD. Mm. So why aren't we dealing with the trauma and the average childhood experiences, mm-hmm. which we should be? Mm. So yeah, there was a school in Texas that uh, tripled recess time and all but eliminated some of the symptoms in, in a lot of these boys, kids. I'm sure of that. Yeah, absolutely. Talk, talk about your stuff you're doing right now. Though. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm someone who struggled with dep- clinical depression and, and alcoholism, drug addiction for a long time, long period of time. Um, and the even though I've been by the grace of God, I've been sober 17 years. I still, lingering anxiety and depression was a serious problem. And I'd been using SSRIs and other different antidepressants and the whole thing. Uh, and my wife, who's a full hippie, uh, <laughs> forced me, well, I don't want to say forced me. She really influenced me to get involved with this brain training where they mapped out my brain and, and, mm-hmm. and its electrical activity. And then they designed a video game mm-hmm that is geared towards my actual brain and, and, and I control it with using my brain activity. Not and it's, with his it's, thoughts. Not, not with my it, thoughts. No, you, just you, with brain un, activity. You, you understand he is accessing parts of his brain that are not conscious, mm-hmm. not thought oriented, not language oriented. And he's doing it in ways he doesn't understand, yeah. but because he has the visual feedback mm. when he gets into those regions and the whatever he's following. Now that's to, interesting. So I have, you're, a, I have you're a not actually, I, I thought you were actually thinking go left. No. To, no, 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 no. And, no, no, and no. I can go. I can go out of my way to meditate while I'm doing it and, and clear my mind. I can think about my fucking go. I'll tell the spaceship <laughs> that I'm like, like you fucker, you go. And and it, it has no relation to how <laughs> successful I am. These are the not, you, activity. You how much brain. of our brain is not conscious and not connected to? No, I do. Ninety-eight percent of it is actually no. Well, not part of uh, it's conscious enough to to recognize the feedback. Right. And yeah. what it does is is the their their map their you know recording my brain activity uh, as I'm playing this video game, and it starts to sense a reward for watching this car or this ship go, mm-hmm. and so it understands that the parameters of certain parts of my brain that are going too high and other parts that are going too low to stay within certain parameters to to. Uh, essentially reward myself with that so, car. So going. the reward, when the reward zing goes through, it, it feeds back to all parts of the brain, all kinds mm-hmm, of areas. Mm-hmm. And so that reward gets that part engaged in essentially a Pavlovian type of response. And I'll tell you, I, I, and I know it sounds wacky and woo-woo in science fiction. It works. So I am a, a, a much more sense. laid back guy. I am definitely much more in control of and it's my not impulses. meditation. It's not meditation. It's literally accessing and either upregulating or downregulating brain regions. Do you know what part you're particularly having trouble with? Dors- uh, my dorsal my lateral, unconscious, it, it, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, something like that. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Find out what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you which brain waves. Like like this area right here. I can tell you which brain waves are, 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 yeah. <laughs> brain waves are overactive and which ones are under, but I have to mean, go get... Was this at the Peak Brain Institute? Oh, you already asked about that? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, and how long until you start, started seeing results from that? I, I've probably done it 13 times and over a course of like two months. Well, what do you... Is it the anxiety you notice or come down? It's just... Yeah, I constantly was worried about work, about... Uh, about food, about you know, I, I would inv- invent these things to be worried and angry about. Uh, subsequently, angry because I would get worried about something and then it would piss me off. And uh, and I'm not an angry person, but I internally had this angst, and that is gone. I mean, I just uh, you know, I, I certainly still get but, upset but who knows, about but, things. But he, and, so that's his conscious experience of it. Uh, the the uncon might have been as over his amygdala was firing at too high a rate, mm-hmm, or his mm-hmm. ventral tech mental area was overactive from his addiction. The thing, the thing I, I think that is perfectly applicable to this podcast is that I don't gorge anymore. Now, don't get me wrong; I still crave Fourth mm-hmm. of July. I saw some ice cream or some cake. <laughs> it still looked good. Had a couple bites. The uh, the days of of cheat day and me going six weeks of eating uh, broccoli and chicken breast and then having four pizzas and washing <laughs> it down with a six pack of Mountain Dew. It's gone, and I and I have. 
I have zero to dire, desire to do so. I, I'm just much more present in everything that I do, and my impulse regulation has so, been so the uh, way the way I would conceptualize it, it's it's improved wiring. Probably he's mm-hmm. probably not only is he upregulating the downregulating the region, he's probably developed some wiring into those. So the brain is now a more integrated whole. Mm-hmm. That's that's the that's a healthy brain. It's an integrated whole brain where all parts are, are regulating in mm-hmm. a in a. Now, uh, Drew, you keep saying that it's it's not meditation. You're making that really clear. Yeah. Now. Do you think that there are some similar benefits that you get from meditating, or do you think it's completely, it's completely different? Completely different. Completely, completely different. different. But there are tons of benefits from meditation. Right, but, right. But people, that's they understand what that is. Right, people right. don't tend to understand what this stuff mm, is. Right. Same thing with like EMDR and things like that. We're, we're accessing parts of the brain that, that people don't know they don't they, that they have, and so yeah. they they don't. It's, it's counterintuitive to them. I have to go do a radio show, guys. Oh, oh okay. yeah. no problem. Uh, that's yeah. why we're here. At this, yeah. right? But but Mike, will you get them give us some advice for them about what to do with my goddamn shoulder? Uh, Drew's shoulders always been bothering him for forever. It started as a, probably a rotator cuff. Oh, we and got, then, the, we oh, got yeah. the moves for you, and then it just we'll, became we'll a you. fix. So we have a program. we have a, we have a program called Prime, and it's now, let me just say I can work I can work out all around it. Mm. I can do it, lift. And nothing happens as long as I don't lift something heavy over my like this is like not possible, right? Uh, and, and everything else is yeah. probably humorous that's a, catching on the shoulder. That's a, that's a that's a that's a ro- I think that's right. It, was, yeah. it feels like it's really like the rotator cuff started it, and then something happened. It's, like probably it's just a recruitment pattern. It's a recruitment pattern, and it's exactly it's become your default we just got to change that default ask about your little new instrument whether that's a good idea or not your oh yeah yeah, I, 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 yeah <laughs> so gentlemen it's been a real pleasure yes, yeah, thank you for having me i'm sorry yeah. i have to run out a little bit no early, problem but uh, appreciate it yeah, thank yeah, you very much got a lot out of this so yeah. thank you and i'm gonna get more when mike reports to me afterwards yeah. all right <laughs> all right thank mike, you take notes absolutely i don't know how intriguing i am gentlemen without him but uh feel free <laughs> very intriguing <laughs> yeah. I, I wonder if that device the way it worked is just that you 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 know you you had your anxiety issues or whatever and then you developed these brain patterns as a result and became this positive feedback loop. And it's like you had to interrupt it and going on that computer device or whatever just interrupted yeah. that. It, well, it, it, there, I, I think Drew had a way of breaking it down that my brain became more of a comprehensive unit. And that mm-hmm. is that makes a lot of sense to me because I, I'm i such a daydreamer. I can't focus on anything. And uh, you know, I'm sur- I came from an era when ADHD and stuff wasn't necessarily that big of a deal and they weren't prescribing you know, Adderall to yeah. every other kid. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I, I always, we, I never was a good student and I had no ability to kind of focus on the task at hand. And I feel like I'm just working on a, a little bit more of my brain than mm-hmm. I, I was before, you know. Very Do you feel like that was contributing to your stand up comedy and like it gave you that sort of uh, mindset as far as like, you know, looking at things a little bit differently? Well, it definitely, I definitely got this sense that. If I was if if task A was important, whether it be school or or football practice, task B, C, and D were the only things that I were foc- was focusing on, and that was what was going on in the grandstands or what was you know what I could possibly draw and and sneak in, listen to on my Walkman during class. So my point being is that I, I constantly not even by my own volition was looking at the subtext of what was going on in life. Mm -hmm. And so I think that made for at least the ability to be a radio personality and have the ability to talk uh, extemporaneously for long periods of time, Mm -hmm. because I never was really focusing on anything else that anybody else was focusing on. Right. You know, I always had these weird, kind of ideas and stuff that was popular. Yeah, that's a good question because I wonder how much of that, you know, contributes to just the creative process, you know what I mean, of of being a little little scattered or... Seeing things differently. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Well, and and there was a... There's a fear that comes from trying to think differently um, and once I got past that and I realized... And I found an industry where people would celebrate it Mm-hmm. That then it became great because you you kind of got the sense that well no maybe sometimes people want to hear a, a different a different mm-hmm. spin on things. Mm-hmm. You know? Mike, yeah. I want to ask you about your your bodybuilding history and your fitness yeah. history early on. Like let's let's talk because you and I are the same age, so mm-hmm. you were into the stuff right around the same time I was. Right. What initially got you into into that sport into that world? Um, I think like. Well, first sports in general. I mean, I was I was an athletic kid. I wasn't by any means someone who was going to be a high level college athlete or anything. But I was always a super athletic guy. Always good, better than the rest of the kids in all sports. You know, mm-hmm. so I you know could play varsity level and stuff. Could play high level when I was in little league. I was always like one of the better kids. The, the whole thing. 
So when I got to be about 13, 14 years old, the notion that I wanted to lift weights was just automatic. Um, and in the early 90s to the mid 90s, I think there was a real, you were hitting a real high level of like the IFBB pros and oh, stuff. Yeah. I, it was just a really good era. Oh, you had you LeBron, know? you had Yates, you had right. Wheeler, all those guys. And, you know, you start picking up the the Flex magazines and stuff and, and the... And even like you know the muscle media that the more the more mainstream palatable stuff too it was just it was I think a really good era for that kind of stuff and I and I I, it, I sucked it up you know and, and I got into it and um, uh, started lifting heavy pretty young you know 14 15 years old and, and I just took to it it was something that I took to I never really was um, automatically or naturally good at much of anything but I quickly could gain muscle and I quickly could could lift heavy uh, compared to the other kids. You know, I, I wasn't an endurance athlete. I never could run the mile very fast and I wasn't a sprinter, but uh, within a couple months I could squat, you know, three plates and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And it felt cool and it felt great. And it was something I was good at. I was good at and it felt healthy and rewarding. And so very quickly I, I kind of became hooked on it. You know? Now, did you train and compete naturally, or were you using anabolics during this period of time? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't ever have any desire to compete in bodybuilding. I never had anything against it. I, I just never thought that that was something for me. And then when I got sober, uh, there was this lingering feeling. Really, I have really bad body image issues. Much better now than um, before. Um, but one of the things that kind of came up through therapy was the idea that, you know, I could tackle this head on, you know, the, the person who is afraid of swimming or afraid of the ocean starts surfing or something. Mm-hmm. You know, this was my way of, of combating it. And I went about it in the most unhealthy way and then immediately <laughs> started doing, you know, 500 milligrams of test and DECA uh, every day, you know, or every week and then and trend and, and uh, eating stimulants and stuff like that and achieved the desired goal physique wise, but then I never really got to the center of what was bothering me. Um, but that, that was certainly my unhealthy motivation to get into competitive bodybuilding. And I think that it, it really skewed the way that I looked at it in the long term because if I would have gone about it in a much more healthy fashion, or at least in a much more holistic fashion, I probably would have been something that I would have stuck with and not, not been had such a cynical kind of view on now what did you think of your peers did you think that they all they too had you know body image issues and or were you not even paying attention to what your peers were doing when you were competing no i wasn't i was and and i wasn't someone who was in it for the competition meaning if i finished second i was fine i I was just happy i could go eat some chili fries and donuts (laughs) you know i I really i wasn't like the guy who's like i gotta fucking take home the trophy um so I, I also was just happy that I had a bunch of dudes that were into something that I was into and I had training partners and, and people that would encourage me and I could encourage them that, that, that the camaraderie aspect of it was much more appealing than the competition aspect. Of it. Did you feel a, a major burnout at all after you were done? Did you find yourself from living the six to eight meals a day training like crazy? And then you're like, okay, I'm done with this. Yeah. What was that transition? like? Yeah. I, one, uh, <sighs> I started to analyze the use of anabolics and the use of stimulants as something that was compromising my sobriety. And when I looked course, at when I looked yeah. at recovery, I, I was thinking to myself, like, well, what am I doing here? I Are mean, just I, trading yeah, one for the other. Right? I, I'm not drinking and I'm not using cocaine, but I, am I am I truly giving my all to my to my recovery? And uh, and I wasn't. And so that that transition, uh, getting clean and really having to commit to post cycle therapy and 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 having to just put my hands up to the loss of my gains and all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff it was it was hard it was certainly hard to deal with and it gave me an fu mentality where i was like well fuck the whole thing i'm just going to give up and i'm not going right. to but uh, gradually i got back into a, a more healthy view on things and 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 it didn't help that i was you know i i was doing a morning show at the time um and i was getting up at 4 in the morning Thirty three thirty four in the morning and staying at work till sometimes till sundown, there was no way I was going to sleep eight hours and there was no way that I was going to get proper recovery. And so I was burning the candle at both ends. It was probably the best thing for me to be able to step back and take some, take a break and get, get, get control of my health as opposed to get control of my abs. How many years was that, that you were actually competing for then? How long did you do it for? Probably about four or five years. Yeah. Now, did you, do you now still have to be on TRT or were you able to? No, no, I'm, I, I'm, Oh wow. Yeah. So that's great. But I mean, you know, we're talking about a, 
God, almost a 15 year span now. I mean, th- mm-hmm. that, this was the early 2000s. Now, I, um, I ran, so I when I competed, and that was just not that long ago, um, I was in it for four years or almost four years. And I was on TRT at 30. Mm-hmm. I'm 36 going on 37 now. And this is the first time. And we're, uh, my girl and I are trying to get pregnant right now. Mm-hmm. So I'm actually trying to be off completely. And it's been, I'm coming on my ninth month. And boy, the last, you know, eight months was was rough. Right. How long did it take you before you kind of started to feel normal again? <sighs> I wish I could say it was quick. Uh, years, yeah. you know, years mm-hmm. where I, where I really felt like uh, uh, I, there was pieces of the day that I enjoyed. I mean, because initially, especially after post cycle therapy ends, it was really rough. Yeah. Like I, I, mean, I got. How am I going to get out of bed today? Yeah. Um, People and, don't realize how depressing it is when your testosterone's in the basement. I know, and I and I and I wish more of that was talked about because mm-hmm. there's such an allure to using mm-hmm. gear. And I'm not, and I'm not the by any means am I some guy that's going to be like, dude, it's only natural, it's yeah. the only way to go. <laughs> if, I, I I totally understand the yeah. appeal, and if you're going to mm-hmm. do it, go about it. But just go in knowing right. that the fallout is tremendous, and mm-hmm. the psychological and emotional tie-in is huge it's not just about losing your gains there is a price to be paid psychologically yeah the, um, one of the things that uh one of the big problems that i see or struggles i see with it is you know because uh, you know i've known a lot of guys and girls who've who've done that and one of the biggest problems is you learn how to train and feed your body in that state of being mm. you know when super physiological you know doses of anabolics so what you think you know about training it's not right because then you go off and now you're natural and you're training your body or at least you remember how to train your body when you were on all this stuff and it's like my body's not responding like it used to i just want to stop everything did you find you had to change your training eventually and just kind of figure things absolutely out? Yeah. yeah absolutely and, and natural a lot of it happened naturally is a lot uh, during the time that i had uh kind of got clean off of off of the gear um this is now four or five years of getting clean off of narcotics and, and, and of alcohol. Um, one of the guys that not only did I party with, but that I trained with and, and used gear with a lot was a, a guy by the name of Orlando Sanchez. And he uh, transitioned from being a power lifter and bodybuilder. And he's a, just a, a naturally gifted guy. I mean, he was squatting five plates, you know, no problem for reps. And he was one of those guys, mm-hmm. big man. But he transitioned from from powerlifting into jujitsu, and so he got me into jujitsu as a way of kind of like just scraping me up off the ground of the mm-hmm. depression and the fallout. And um, so naturally, I had to stop being so worried about carb count and mm-hmm. nutrition timing, and 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 feed myself for performance and for health. And uh, the tie-in um, helped tremendously because I I started to realize how. Not only how my body would react as far as uh, my physique and, and the the aesthetics to certain foods, but how my body would feel. You know, if I could, if I was going to go train, yeah, it's okay to have, you know, a couple bananas. Maybe and, one of the most brilliant things you did. Yeah, I yeah. did the exact same thing. I did the exact same thing. I went from heavy, heavy, you know, training, and then you know, and I would take the over the counter designer steroids, which, you know, you can't buy them anymore, but it wasn't that long ago. You could buy like, you know, methyl master draw or, yeah, you yeah. know, whatever, which were basically steroids that you buy over the counter. And I take those and, and there was a moment where I said, I got to stop all this and, and, and start taking care of myself. I did the exact same thing. I started doing jujitsu and jujitsu was so good because if you want to be good at jujitsu, you have to focus on the technique and necessary and being the biggest, strongest dude isn't necessarily going to help you. Absolutely. So I was able to take my mind off of the I got to be big and strong and okay, I want to perform in jiu-jitsu. I was able to change my diet, able to change my training and it really helped that transition because if I just stayed in the weight training aspect of it, I think it would have been so much harder. Yeah, and if I if I would have stayed in it and I I I never I never in a million years was one I never was one of those kids that sat at home when I was a little kid uh like like a seacrest or something. I never thought I'd be doing what I wanted what I'm doing now. I never thought I'd oh, be really? on the radio. Mm-hmm. I never thought I'd be on TV or something like that. So um, if I would have stayed in that, that world, you know, when I was 22, I was 225 pounds and my traps were hitting my, my, my ears. <laughs> 
can't exactly go on TV like that. I mean, <laughs> unless you're The Rock, which right. you know, what I'm saying? Arnold, it's hard to it's hard to yeah. present on Access Hollywood when you're wearing a size 56 <laughs> suit. You know, it's like, <laughs> the famous gorilla. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just one of those things that it happened to work out in, in a way that was serendipitous. You know? How did you yeah. get into what you're doing now? How did that start? Uh, God, man, I I was I was a wannabe rock star, and that's where the drugs and alcohol came in. Mm. And when that failed for a myriad of reasons, I moved back to LA. I'm, I'm actually from here. And, uh, I came hat in hand to my parents saying that I needed help. And, um, I got a job at K rock, the radio station here, the rock radio station here as a, as like a side gig, you know, as a way to put, put food, uh, on the table and to, to pay my rent just at entry level job. Now you just walked in and applied there or there, did you I, have connections I, at all? No, or? no, 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 no. I, I, I was literally looking for jobs and there, I was a, a, a custodian at a, a prosthetics lab oh, and wow. I was, uh, so this could oh, have been almost anything that's yeah. kind right. Of crazy. And I was just looking at for like job availability wow. and they were hiring at the uh, at b- entry level, you know, to, to push boxes and, and drive the jocks around and stuff like that, hand out stickers. And, uh, so I, I applied, I got a job there and I started like prank calling the morning show mm. and doing pranks around the station and on purpose or like, yeah, like, yeah, they, yeah. like, like they told you to, or you were just fucking no, around. No, no, I was just, just busting balls. It, was, it seemed like, <laughs> it seemed like awesome. an incredibly good place to bust yeah. balls and it, and it really was. Oh, that's great. And, um, it, about a year later, uh, of working in, in that job, the, the morning show was hiring for an assistant production job and they, People around the station had said like, "Oh, this guy's funny and he's really stupid. He'll do stupid <laughs> shit." <laughs> and uh, they hired me, and then that was like 2003. And then I, I just, I had a career in broadcasting. I don't know how. I mean, yeah. it, it was one of those things that you couldn't believe. I mean, when you got into it, was it? Did you feel like you were a natural right away? No, I, no, yeah, no. Yeah. I was like, because I look is, back to our old episodes, I think we were oh, terrible. Yeah, no, right? I, yeah. I was good, but everybody else, right. <laughs> no, I completely. <laughs> yeah, but. Uh, no, no. And when I'd get on the air, I felt, uh, self-conscious and I was mm. nervous and I, and, um, I, I felt like I was a naturally funny person and that somehow I couldn't translate that mm-hmm. to being funny on the air. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I'd get so, so, so self-aware. Um, but then like with anything reps happen yeah. and, and I, I, my heart rate stopped changing when I was on the air and off the air and then things happen. And I, I, I really, by total accident, built a career in broadcasting, and then got on TV, and that was you know. Do you remember? And you're like the jingle master. I am a. I, yeah. I'm a. I. Uh, that is, if I have any God given talent, it's the ability <laughs> to on the spot make up silly, stupid, catchy songs. Yeah, <laughs> oh, which it's is great. It's a great talent. It's, it's been it's been great for for like podcasting and, and stupid jingles on the radio. Yeah, but it's been excellent. I had a daughter and. I could just make up bullshit songs about yeah. like, oh, look at the balloon is going to the moon, and we could say she thinks it's. Dude, I my know. kids make me read every single uh, story. I have to like make shit up and yeah. like make it about poop and farts and whatever, <laughs> right. just to keep their entertainment. You but know? it's awesome because yeah. they think you're John Lennon. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do you remember He's my ego? Do, do you remember points in your career that were like milestones, like that you were like kind of leveling up your skill set? Do you remember? Yeah. Like, I what was like the first big like moment for you on radio where you're just like fuck yeah I killed it or I'm I'm doing things or well the, there was the moment where I realized uh, the morning show I was on the Kevin and Bean morning show here is you know it's been on the air in, in Los Angeles for thirty years it was this just this cornerstone of broadcasting and the you know the largest radio market there mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. Um, and when I realized that they trusted me to be on the air without any cause without any double checking when they knew that if I had something to say that they could turn to me, that was, um, that was something that really meant something to me. But when, when I host started hosting love line, that was it. Mm. That was, I I grew up listening to love line. I Mm -hmm. grew up taking Corolla and, and Drew's advice and, (laughs) and really applying it and thinking it was so hysterical and, and, and crank calling the show. You know, I, I prank called, Corolla and Drew twice <laughs> as a as a little kid, you know. And so, do you remember what you said? You yeah, remember? one time I called um, Cypress Hill was the guest. This is probably like ninety two, ninety three, yeah. 
And you're I, like twelve or thirteen. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was, I was. It was summer before eighth grade, or summer, summer before freshman year, but somewhere in that ballpark. And saying the membrane around. Yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and so Cypress Hill was the guest, and I called saying that uh, I smoked so much weed that I could lactate. <laughs> <laughs> that my breasts had grown and I could actually like and Dr. Drew's like well that's that's physiologically impossible so, <laughs> and Be Real was like no nah, nah, I, urban I think I have yeah. a homeboy does the same thing <laughs> I've heard about that yeah man. that was my yeah. only like successful prank call you know uh, or at least in my eyes was successful yeah first 15 yeah. minutes of fame right there yeah sure. <laughs> so but, but then you know so when I started hosting the show it's it, for a long period of time for like six months in it, it seemed surreal like I, I couldn't believe that I get to interview rappers and rock stars and and take kids' calls about sex and drugs and stuff. Like, that's what I do for a living, and people pay me for it. This is fucking awesome. Weird. Uh, Yeah. yeah. How did you meet them then at that? Because you were a fan. How did you get a chance to meet them and get on the show? Well, the the flagship station for Loveline uh, was K-Rock. So I was already working at the station. And um, Corolla had left to go on and do his own morning show. Um, And so there was this vacancy. And for a period of time... Drew tried to do the show by himself, and uh, I took it upon myself to to throw my hat in the ring. And I approached the program director, and I said, "I really think, oh, okay. you know, with my experience and, and being in recovery and uh, being a, a complete sexual fuck up, that I, you know, I can bring <laughs> something to the show." And so they started trying me out, and, and then lo and behold, they uh, they thought it was a good idea mm, to, yeah. to hire me. Uh, how how about the beginning of your podcast now, Swole Patrol? How did that start? And it really was organic like when drew and i stopped doing love line um when was that by the way when did you guys stop doing 2015 2000 yeah somewhere around there so. was there any particular reason why it stopped? It was quite popular yeah uh I, I i had started to have other work um and then the show itself it, it because of the prescription pill epidemic it had transformed into an addiction show Mm-hmm. And 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 the, and it was an abuse and addiction show, and I had felt like it was starting to take its toll on me. Oh, it was really it oh, was wow. actually interesting emotionally taking its toll. Sure. I could only come home from work uh, at one in the morning every night and uh, talk to three people about being raped and four people about being touched by their father and another twenty people about uh, how their wife's leaving them because they're addicted to Percocet. And I I really I was like I. I'm not, I didn't have any training. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not an MD. I don't, I can't deal with this, mm-hmm. you know? And so I told Drew, well, the show will go on if I leave. Yes. He's like, yeah, I don't like it, but uh, I'll f- we'll figure out something to do. So I, I resigned from doing it. And, was that, uh, now, was that a big risk for you financially? I would think that was probably a, a big bulk of your income at the time, or were you making other stuff on side gigs that didn't really stress you out? It at was, all? it was a big risk financially. In a sense, but at the same time, my wife's an actress and it's a successful one. So I, I mean, I'm not to sound like, you know, well, I'll just rely on my sugar mama. <laughs> but it was, right. you know, there was no real o- overreaching threat because right, right. my wife was the on a The bills are getting in a gig. My wife was on a network sitcom. You know, it was like, uh, the, it was this uh-huh. stupid money, you know, you know, for, for her. So uh, the bills would be taken care of. And I, and I had other established jobs. Um, but I, you know, it's something that I really felt like in the long term, it was going to be beneficial for me. Even though I really did love love doing it, um, Drew figured that the show would go on. I think like four months after me leaving the show, Drew's like, "I I can't do this mm. anymore." He just, uh, I I know that he you know, a, a piece of it was that he really liked doing it with me, and it wasn't the same without doing w- without doing it with me. But another piece of it was. Drew been doing it for thirty two years. Yeah. Damn, it was that yeah. long. I yeah. was doing it for six, and I was feeling burnt. God, oh, I was a kid. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's been that long. Yeah, that's where I got all my sex education. No, in I remember, high school. I, was I remember yeah, listening yeah. too. I didn't realize it was that yeah, long. Yeah, that's yeah. A long ass time. It was ago. the longest running syndicated radio show in mm-hmm. in America. Mm-hmm. Oh wow, so, uh, crazy. Well, thirty two. You know, in the early eighties, it started, and uh, and it, and it, I I think he had really <laughs> felt it transform too, because when it started, that was like at the height of the AIDS epidemic. Um, right, it was all sex talk. And and that was, they, STD and sex talk. They really I mean. needed that show. And in the 90s, it continued because there was the fallout from the you know the AIDS explosion or what was perceived to be the AIDS explosion. And there was the introduction to the first you know American heroin explosion after the crack epidemic. And, mm-hmm. and so there was constantly this, this, this ever-changing need to have a show like that. Yeah. I think the internet changed a lot, you know, when kids could start Googling everything and then feeling like they were the expert 
they didn't need to check with a doctor anymore. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and honestly, like the prescription pill stuff just deflated everything. It's bad. It, it's horrifying. You know, yeah, it's and, really, it, and it's totally different than other narcotic problems. It makes it sense why Drew was so like about it right away. Yeah. As soon as I brought it up, you could tell that's just like a sour, sour taste yeah. in his mouth. Well, because and he'll be the first to admit it's his it's his colleagues that are causing the problem. Yeah. It's that, you know, there's such a lack of understanding of the disease of addiction amongst the medical community. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, people always get into, oh, it's big pharma. It's big. No, the reality is, is that people are prescribing some of the most powerful and dangerous drugs on the planet for people with broken fingers, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's something that shouldn't be done, you know? You know, you said that you you were having a tough time when it got to that point and coming home and dealing with all that. And I find there to be a a very therapeutic effect from our show just for me, and we've all talked about this. Do you you find podcasting uh, to be therapeutic for you as well? I do when when the scene is right. Yeah, Mm -hmm. man, if we're talking nutrition and training with people experts in the field there's it's nothing like it you know mm-hmm. it's uh, it's great I mean, anytime you can do get paid to do something that you really <laughs> right. legitimately love that you doing, would do off air anyways right? i mean you guys you you guys will get out of this podcast get back in an uber and continue to talk training and and, and nutrition absolutely I mean, that's just, you know so it's it's awesome that you can do that and, and i'm the same way so for me it, it, it's awesome now when it goes south and it becomes work, yeah, it, mm-hmm. it, can, it can suck. You know, when you get someone on who's dogmatic about certain things or refuses to be open minded about certain ideas or, or gives one word answers, you, you know, when you have a hard time just <laughs> oh, interviewing yeah. someone. Yeah, how often know? does that That's happen brutal. when you get an interview? I feel like almost every, I'm always wrong. Somebody yeah. who I think is going to be amazing, they sit down in the chair and I'm like, fucking dry as shit or yeah. dogmatic or just one word answers. It's really particularly frustrating in, in podcasting because you reach out to these people thinking that they're experts in the field and they're going to have something to say. In, in the old radio days, it was something you prepare for because you don't oftentimes expect rock stars and stuff to be lighting the airwaves on fire. I right. mean, a lot of times they're aloof right. and they're... Yeah. Uh, just like athletes, potentially right. high. Exactly, yeah. You know, I mean, you go into interviewing bands and stuff knowing like, well, there's a potential these guys are going to fucking suck. Right. Yeah. Let them plug they're their super album. Super high. And yeah. just, yeah. I got to carry this thing. Yeah. Right, so, but but it's it kind of, it is a little bit frustrating in, in podcasts because you're like, why did you even agree to do this if you're not... Gonna, I mean, the mm-hmm. whole point of a podcast is for you to kind of promote what you're doing and give Have some, some dialogue right? yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> be enthusiastic yeah. yeah yeah so so then so let's get to swole patrol how did yeah. that go how did that start well drew and i had always been and uh you even commented when you sat down it's like alarming how muscular drew is i mean yeah. a lot of people don't really i didn't realize. even know that yeah, yeah, yeah i walk in i'm like this guy you don't see that on tv yeah, yeah he's, drew, he's drew. got like 17 inch arms Drew's really into lifting and Jacks. training and he, and he likes it and he's and he's into it and he's in, interested in it intrigued by it um, and we always, always, man, every pretty much every second off the air, if we weren't talking Instagram models, we were talking about. <laughs> I things. feel like sometimes you guys could be just like yeah, for sure. If we all live in the same town, we'd all be hanging Seriously. out. All the time. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll show Drew like some Instagram model or some, some, some new girl that I find, and he analyzes it like this is a brooder tape. It's like, oh yes, yes. Let me put my glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm, yes. oh, I see like, what you did there. Like, nice hip to waist ratio. Um, <laughs> but we were constantly talking training, constantly talking lifting and and, uh, and and exercise and nutrition, and people would request it. Yeah, we would get tweets. We would get blah blah, blah and and you know people would send us <laughs> tweets like. I just started doing keto. What do you think about? Uh, I, I'm feeling tired. Blah blah blah. Getting all these wacky questions, and then naturally, it just like the idea came about. Now that we weren't working in radio together, let's try to do a podcast together. Mm-hmm. And so, what would, what should we do to kind of separate it? And we thought, let's do a health and fitness yeah. one, and that it just kind of came about. It, now, is it hard? Because there was a couple times when we were talking earlier where you would comment and you'd say, "Yeah, you didn't listen to me when I was saying it for the last couple of years. Yeah. You listen to someone else." Sometimes the medical community can be so difficult to convince uh, or to talk to when it comes to nutrition and training. Some of the most pushback I've ever gotten yeah. mm-hmm. in fitness has been from doctors, you know, like telling them, like, no, I don't think Mrs. Johnson should eat a 75% you know, carbohydrate diet. I think right. she needs to eliminate. How was that? Has that worked between you guys when you guys are talking? Well, about? I don't think he doesn't listen to me because he's a doctor. I think he doesn't listen to me because I'm me. <laughs> so uh, the pushback I get isn't from you know from a medical perspective. I think mm. it's just that he just doesn't listen. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> Which, you know, I understand. Uh, you got to understand, like, when you have that much understanding of the human body and physiological yeah, activity you're skeptical and what chemistry, anyone says to you about anything. When people are not scientists, you are, you, you, mm. it's, it's easy to be dismissive, you know, mm. and, and I totally understand that. Much like if some fat fuck came to you guys and started giving you training advice, it would yeah. be very easy to just be dismissive about it. Um, you know, the human body has so, so many millions of different cellular processes that someone like myself who has really very little understanding of, of those from a, from a physiological standpoint, um, I oftentimes defer to him even mm-hmm. when it comes to, to certain things. So there was never any real friction in, in me not getting him to – but – there was a tremendous amount of validation when in turn <laughs> right. four I told years you. Yeah, down yeah, the yeah. road, I'd be like, yeah. see you asshole. If you only, <laughs> yeah. well, plus, right. there's, plus there's so much, I mean, let's be honest. There's so much bullshit in yeah. our, in our industry. I mean, the, the supplement market alone is just absolutely insane. And you've been doing this long enough to see all the different pieces of that market grow. And I mean, when we were working out as kids, there wasn't a pre-workout supplement market really. No. Now all of a sudden it's like, you got to have your pre-workout supplement I know. with the right amino acids and the right, you know, whatever. And I'm, kids are always uh, tweeting me. They're like, what's the best uh, pre-workout? I go, coffee. Yeah. yeah. It's <laughs> nothing better. It's pretty awesome. Right. Right. It's here. amazing. It's cheap and it's effective. <laughs> You'd be surprised. It's the one ingredient that yeah. works. Yeah. I just read, I just showed these guys a study that just, just today where they compared... Yeah. Uh, two groups of people. One group had 100 milligrams of caffeine, tyrosine, theanine. I forgot a couple other nootropics. And then the other group just had the caffeine. Guess which one performed better? Really? The pure caffeine yeah. group performed yeah. better. Although it's a wonder the, drug. Yeah, although the subjective effects of the other stuff was they felt more awake. Yeah. But when they actually did the cognitive test, the pure caffeine mm. group I, I've said that hands down, overall, if you really do a checks and balances of the, of the ups and downs, Side effects are caffeine is the best drug on earth. Oh, yeah, what yeah. most widely used, and it's just the best right. yeah, as far as as <laughs> yeah. far as effectiveness, as far as desired effect, right. effectiveness, uh, safety, safety, yeah. lack of lack of side effect and positive long, benefits, lack of long term pro, uh, you know any prolonged effects. It's the best because. Like cocaine's awesome. I put LSD up there and everything, but there's always a, a litany of negative yeah. fallout yeah. on the back end <laughs> and with caffeine there's just no i mean i can't think of maybe aspirin you know is yeah, a, yeah. another up there winner which yeah. is fascinating because we're in the middle right now in the last 10 15 years the the pre-workout market is just exploded I know. it's the number one supplement that's sold and really, right now, all the majority of the benefits that everybody it's feels. All the stimulants they put in on it. Right. But I mean, the majority, the real bang for the buck in those things is the caffeine. Right. And all they're doing is, is just jumping it up. I mean, now, it, they, I, I, to be fair, I, I will occasionally turn to those, but I, I got to be honest, mostly it's just because of like the taste. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes I'll find one like a bang or something where I'm like, this is fucking delicious. Yeah. <laughs> it's got no calories and everything. I say, eh. you know, and one out of three workouts, I'll, I'll turn to something. I think it was, was it Super Pump 250 that really blew that market up? I remember the advertising in the magazines. It was absolutely brilliant. They would show guys before and after right, right. the workout. So they'd have these dudes that already had a lot of muscle, and everybody, anybody who lifts weights knows. If you get a decent amount of muscle, you look way different when you get after a pump. You pump yeah. yeah, and they'd be like before and after Super Pump two fifty. I'm like, I was. I remember reading the magazine, be like, these oh, motherfuckers. Shit. This is some brilliant shit. It's like the biggest group of snake oil salesmen. Oh my yeah. god, the supplement oh. market is. Oh, it's, it's terrible. It's crazy. It's absolutely terrible. terrible the is there is there anything that you use now on a regular basis? Not re- you- fish oil. Uh, yeah. I, you know, creatine. I, I mean, I, creatine's I, the most. I mean, that come on, that that yeah. gives people benefits for sure. And, and you know, creatine, fish oil, and uh, and like like I said, caffeine. I mean, I'm a big, big believer. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, but as far as like even micronutrients and stuff, like I, I take uh, magnesium at night. Mm-hmm. I find it like that. And uh, some, my doctor told me to uh, bump up my vitamin D, so I did. But mm-hmm. besides that, uh, yeah, it's literally the exact same stuff except for the magnesium. What yeah, the two, the the other, the two kind of you know gray market things that I'm seeing now that you're starting to hear athletes talk about using. Uh, endurance athletes are using uh, cannabis uh, mm-hmm. to enhance the performance and endurance. And then I've been reading now that some lifters are using Viagra. Yeah. Uh, have you heard of this? I have heard you, about that. Yeah. Now, that was an old school thing. 
I remember back as a kid coming in the gym and seeing pills of Viagra on the floor and stuff. So that was something that they used to do back then. Now, the, the theory back then was... The pump, right? The NO2 yeah, yeah, yeah. was to vasodilate you, and that's why they, they did it back then. Now, I don't know how much of that is true or if it actually really works. Well, Dexter, or you just get Dexter a big- Jackson told me, uh, not to name drop too much, but I work out at, at Gold's in Venice. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I'm, I'm constantly bumping elbows. With it. But he's like, it makes no sense. Why would you want to get your pump quicker you want to delay the pump so that you could get more the, the idea of taking a viagra and then i'm so i'm super artificially swolled up at 10 reps when i could have gotten 16 that's an interesting theory. well the that, studies that that's they, an interesting theory though yeah. what he's saying because you could i could see people who don't really track their workouts or planning like that that you chase the pump you get this pump and you're like oh cool i'm done you know what right. I'm saying? Like this massive pump goes down Right, right. And maybe not even realizing that they, they could be doing exercises that are more effective or whatever because they're getting a pump so easy. Right. Yeah, they did studies on it and showed improved performance at altitude. Otherwise, they didn't see any improved athletic performance. The other one that I'm seeing in this gray market kind of thing is this microdosing of LSD. Yeah. You're starting to see a lot of that where people – have you heard about any of this? Yeah, I, I know it's like some some entertainment types and some tech geeks that do it. Mm-hmm. And uh, they, they purport amazing benefits. It's something I, I can't even think about doing because – of uh, addiction, but uh, you know, whatever. I, 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 <laughs> uh, Drew is even signing off on they're doing ketamine infusion. You know, uh, in a, in a clinical setting you for know, depression, the, for for depression, and wow. he's seeing a lot of huge mm. benefits from that. And uh, the the MDMA, you know, mm-hmm. for like couples therapy and stuff. So mm-hmm. I, I'm sure. Listen, every drug, g- what, whether we could consider them quote unquote good or bad, was invented for a reason. Right. Um, and and every single drug, it, Drew always says, there's no such thing as a good or bad drug. There's just how you use it. Mm. Right. Every drug is good. Every drug is bad. It's just a matter of in what capacity. Morphine, if you got shot in the stomach, you is want the morphine. best thing in the world. Right. It, it, morphine, if you're in World War One, is is a godsend. Morphine, if you are addicted to it and you're taking it because you're a soccer mom that is depressed, <laughs> is is the worst thing on the planet, you know. Mm-hmm. And if you're going to use MDMA for couples therapy, it's fantastic. If you're at uh, EDC and you're yeah, taking your every weekend, hit, yeah. <laughs> yeah so. What does your training and, and diet look like now? You had mentioned keto style diet, or is that not, not not as much for me because uh, you know with Muay Thai and and and. Um, jiu-jitsu and you stuff like carbs. i just yeah i feel like it when i'm not uh glycolytic i, I bonk too quickly mm-hmm. man I, and I, and the stakes are too not so much in jiu-jitsu because i'll just tap but in muay thai if i if i'm a minute into a three minute round and i'm tired like i'm like that's man, not a good place yeah, to be like, and it's, it's <laughs> terrifying it's more terrifying than anything when i feel like i can't even raise my hands and this guy's kicking <laughs> me in the fucking head <laughs> so that, that uh so i i'm i'm much more uh i mean i'm cognizant of my carb intake but i i'm much more carb fueled than someone who would be uh in a ketogenic diet and i i train um i do resistance training uh day one i'll do some type of interval training day two and then take day three off. Now that doesn't mean completely off. I might, I might train in a martial art, but as far as, um, you know, fitness kind of, and then I I just repeat that. So, you know, one, two, three is my, my breakdown. And, uh, um, and it works for me and I try to try to stay active throughout the day too. It's another thing I, you know, I, I, I'm not one from my old bodybuilding days. I used to train as hard as I possibly could. And then just try to engage in nothing but recovery. Try to conserve calories outside of outside of that? that. And now you know I'm I'm constantly going on walks. You know just just because mm-hmm. and trying to uh, go out for swim, go for surf, whatever it is. Just these little teeny bursts of activity throughout. Mm-hmm. The day. Mike, what, what consumes most of your time now, like business wise? Like how much are you putting towards podcasting? How much TV? How much radio? Like what what's your like- TV's the most as far as business. Um, uh, radio takes up very little. I only do radio once a week now. Uh, on Sirius XM on my friend Jason Ellis, the Jason Ellis show mm-hmm. on uh, Faction Talk. Um, and that's only once a week. So that's my only real radio commitment. Um, but uh, television with Access Hollywood has been probably, you know, my biggest right now. Yeah. Uh, my biggest commitment business wise. Talk, talk about that. I mean, I don't I've, I don't think I have any friends that actually mm-hmm. have the experience like you do in all three of those facets and then even dabbling and doing right. what you're doing in mm-hmm. podcasting. What do you see the difference in all the different mediums, like everything from financially to how you enjoy it? To- Creative control. It's the number one biggest difference. And that's why podcasting is about now. Uh, obviously, television financially is still the best. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's nothing like the, as far as work, actual work you do to the money you get paid. Mm. Television still science fiction. You go, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? You're going to pay but me this much? <laughs> now, it's not because it's such hard work. It's not. 
and uh, whether you're an actor or a broadcaster, you do you get paid way too much for the work that you do. The reason you get paid so much in television is because there's more job applicate more job applicants than any other job in the world, and there's less job openings. So to get through the crucible of actually getting a job, a high paying job in television, whether you're an actor or a broadcaster, getting to the point where you got there, you had to eat so much shit. And you had to do so much. You had to work so much and 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 deal with so much uh, of being told no and rejection and ridicule and all that to get to the point where you actually have that job. That's why they pay you ridiculous mm-hmm. amounts of money. You know, even more so in acting. My wife's an actor, and she and she her life's good, and the amount of bullshit that they have to put up with is so hmm. fucking insane. I mean, it's truly it's remarkable the amount of of ridicule, the amount of dismissiveness and rejection and how brutal that industry is, that's why they get paid. Because it's not the work that they do. Mm. Filming a half-hour sitcom is not that hard. <laughs> and it's not that... It, it really it takes very little work and you get paid insane amounts of money. But to get to the point where you're doing that, you had to do so much and, and endure so much. Now, what about like the, the politics? Is it very political yeah. and a lot of shit like that too? Yeah, I, I just did a... a, a online piece uh, for uh, Control Forever, which is like an online news outlet, and they had me do an online investigative thing for uh, interviewing the Bloods and the Crips. And the, oh, oh, shit. Wow. Getting to know the modern day um, aspect, the modern day life of gangbangers. You know? So it was fascinating, right? Mm-hmm. But I was talking to this girl yesterday when I was doing that, and she's a, she's a Blood, and she's a um, young lady, like her early 30s, and she was talking about her life, uh, and she said... You, you obviously have, didn't wear that jersey. I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> it's, so not, funny. Oh, it's so funny how uh, like, I, I uh, had to really go out of my way to find clothes that aren't blue and that, red. That are, right? that are, and I was like, man, is neutral? there any? Yeah, so I had to wear like black pants and a white t-shirt. Um, but uh, she said, listen, the streets don't care. The streets don't care about you at all. And the same goes the entertainment industry. The entertainment industry doesn't care. And that, and that you can get this idea that, hey, oh, this manager, he he actually, he's my friend, man. He cares about you. this This producer on this TV show, man, oh, he's, he's looking out for my best interest. No. <laughs> the industry as a whole is a monolith and they don't give a fuck. It's wow. about bottom line. Hmm. Uh, more, more so, it's a more callous industry and more divorced industry from human emotion than any other. Wow. You know, really. Hmm. What what is it? What it, it all, uh, even it, even more so than athletics because at least athletics you understand that, right? Right. right. You go. Oh, in, you can you, see. I didn't right. Even you you see the it's performance just decline. Right and it's just like yeah. sorry, you're not going to get the job done. We got to cut you. Yeah. We love you. Yeah, you're a hometown favorite. You know the fans love you. But now, do you guys do? Do you and your wife get like feedback? Like, oh, the show's performing really well. This and that, and you know, or it's hey, it's underperforming. Step up. Like, do you get any of that feedback? Or yeah, I mean, my, my wife much more so. I mean, the actors uh, constantly ratings are just such a unless it's a streaming service like Netflix or something. They, mm-hmm. You know, they that's really much more subjective. But uh, networks, they uh, it's constantly just analyzing the trades and reading you know ratings and stuff I and mean, then biting those nails and wondering when hmm. you know your show's going to get its axe you know how has uh, hollywood changed as a result of like netflix and, and yeah the new how, media how have you seen yeah they uh, it's uh, the radio has changed because of podcasting so much and i think i don't know if hollywood's changing quick enough that's mm. the problem they don't i i mean i don't understand how networks now i'm very blind to the reality that is i always say to myself how could anybody watch this bullshit show fill in the blank show on cbs nbc abc and what i don't realize is that's because all my cool hip friends are all talking about this new hbo and netflix show Mm -hmm. but the reality is 25 million fucking people watch this show that i think is so stupid Mm -hmm. so we all can make fun of it how archaic this system is but clearly with advertising and with ratings the networks are still doing something right. They're just not on the cutting edge. Mm-hmm. You know, if you watch, it's a big ship too. That's hard to turn. It's a hard ship to turn. And you know, recently, uh, Rolling Stone magazine was up for sale, and and they, you know, they were filing for bankruptcy, and it was this big deal. You know, Rolling Stone, how good? And my friends are like, how could Rolling Stone have come so far and, and, and gone so far down? And I say, it's very easy. Didn't evolve. It didn't. And, and, and I could totally understand it's like doing it. If I'm the editor in chief of Rolling Stone and I have Iggy Pop on my speed dial and I have, you know, Dave Grohl on my, on mm-hmm. my speed and I'm, I'm just chit chatting with Trent Reznor, 
do you think I'm going to let someone from Vice tell me how to do my job? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I was like, are you kidding me? I used to yeah. party backstage with Led Zeppelin. You little <laughs> kids and your new internet, you know, your, oh, wow. your new fangled business. You're going to tell me how to do my thing? It's yeah. very easy to understand how people get hmm. stuck in their ways when they've had such large amounts of success. And the same thing goes, I think, with, with radio and, po- you know, oh, Really? A couple million people listen to Joe Rogan's podcast. You know, and I've got ratings all throughout the 80s and 90s. I used to back the Brinks truck up with my radio station. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, the, it, it's very easy to get caught it's up in this ego. idea yeah. that, well, I've had such amazing success. How could there be a new way of doing things? Mm-hmm. And the reality is there's definitely a new way of doing things. So is that I've... part of the, the the pivot for you guys to even have Swole Patrol? Is it kind of like to protect yourself? Because I think it's really smart that you got, I mean, you think about, you got your hands in almost everything. That was a latent benefit. The reality was, is just like I wanted to have something that I could have creative control over because mm. I love doing Access Hollywood, but I go in and I'm you do told, tell, yeah. I, I'm, I, I do what the bosses tell me. I mean, I, I get to interview people and it's a live show, which is awesome. You know, it's great. And I get to interview people that, uh, in, in a fashion that I want to ask the question I want to ask. But when the show is over, you better believe the, the producer is going to come, you know, executive producer gonna come and be like, and eh, it didn't work out for me. And you better do it this way. Uh, you know, because he writes the checks. That's the bottom doing, line. Doing a live show like that where you, I mean, you've got to be on, you can't, yeah. do you have, do you have tricks that you've picked up over the years of like tactics? If you have a guest that, fluffs or draws a blank or or the every time i'm sure there's been times where you've been stuck in that situation yeah, like and it's i just remind i always remind myself don't take it too seriously you're talking about paris hilton and 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 beyonce <laughs> you know what i'm saying like i'm not on 60 minutes right and I, but believe me i like that in today's uh, television world television news is so divisive and it's so vitriolic i'm very happy to talk about fluff you know, yeah. people are like, oh, it's superficial. I'm like, you're damn right. Right. It's, uh, but at least no one's yelling at me. Right, right. You know, I did political talk radio for three or four years, and, and it got, as soon as the Trump, uh, oh my not, even, not even his presidency, as soon as the campaign started. Mm. And this is to say nothing about the president in a political fact. I'm just simply saying that the, the environment that he ushered in uh, at the beginning of the campaign, let alone his presidency, it got to the point that no matter what I said, people were going to call and yell at me. And I'm like, look, I, some people may thrive on that. It's not for me. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy yeah. to go talk about some new reality yeah. show. Sex online. tape. I'd yeah. rather talk about that. Exactly. Shit. Exactly. <laughs> you know. So, but as far as like the when things go poor and when things fail on a live setting, I just remind myself like you're 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 on a live show about entertainment news. Have fun with it. You know. You know. And the nothing that we're doing is is a, of any concern to anybody really you know yeah. <laughs> like, yeah it's fun it's a great job and i'm sure people enjoy watching it but uh, this is not consequential it's not mm, any know? guess that yeah. you rubbed the wrong way oh yeah yeah, yeah. oh yeah yeah uh, one of the spice girls not not so much in a wrong way like seriously like she after the show was over she gave me a hug and she was laughing about it but i was busting her chops that she said her kids love spice world I was like, no one likes Spice World. Oh, no. like, this is not true. <laughs> they like it because you're in it because mommy's oh, in a movie, but that yeah. movie, they don't like that movie. Yeah. Don't tr- she they don't much, want to accept that. They would much rather watch Frozen <laughs> than Spice World. <laughs> don't try to pull that up. Uh, and uh, I didn't really like sit with the I re- Like the cameramen were laughing, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, shit, man. Thanks for letting yeah, us talk man. to you, brother. Absolutely, yeah, man. Yeah, it, yeah, honestly, it was, it was fun, my man. pleasure. I'm glad we could finally work it out. Man, yeah, I would sure. love no, to have you guys exactly. up at the studio. You guys, if do you, you guys ever go are to ever Bay Area? The, yeah. I, I do uh, with uh, relative frequency. My friend, my fam, my wife's family has, you know, she has extended family that's uh, in San Jose. So uh, every once in a while. But uh, Drew, now, Drew just doesn't travel for business. Oh, we don't even need Drew. He's it's such okay. a... He's, yeah, such yeah, an yeah. Over, he's such an <laughs> overwhelmingly you, busy guy. Yeah. I was, you know, I wanted to it's ask him, but he was out. Right? I was like, yeah. this guy is on every fucking show, and he's a doctor. I know he still sees patients. He's still oh, a shit. fucking doctor. That's right. He the- still puts his stethoscope on and goes in. Oh yes, your knee feels a little bit. Dumb. That's crazy. I know. Yeah. Crazy. I know. I, know. Yeah, <laughs> I got. I got to step up my yeah, game. That's a lot. Right. But yeah, next time you're up in the area, man, get, let us know. We'll yes, have sir. you come into our studio. Oh, yeah. and have always, you back on always the show. welcome, brother. I would love that. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at MindPumpMedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes Maps Anabolic. MAPS Performance and MAPS Aesthetic 
Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump. <laughs>